السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا لیکچر نمبر فورٹی ون فار دا سیریز آف لیکچرس آن ایڈوانس کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر ٹوڈے وی ول اسٹارٹ ود دا لاسٹ ماڈیول آف دی لیکچرس آن ایڈوانس کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر دس ماڈیول ڈیلس ود the networks and clusters today our focus of discussion will be the interconnections and topologies of networks after a brief review of what we discussed last time i will talk about what is a simple network what are different network topologies and if the time allows then we will talk about internetworking also last time we concluded our discussion on the io systems which include the storage ios and communication ios in this discussion we notice that the dependability reliability and availability of the storage ios mostly influence the overall performance of computer systems dependability is the quality of developed service such that the confidence can be placed on this service the dependability is measured by quantifying the transitions between service accomplishment and service interruptions this means that how much time is required to accomplish the service and for how much time there have been interruptions in the service the dependability is measured in terms of the reliability and availability of a module in the system where the reliability of a module is measured by the continuous service accomplishment or it is measured by the time to failure from reference initial instance whereas the availability of a module is the measure of the service accomplishment with respect to the swinging between the accomplishment and interruption states while talking about the storage ios we notice that the storages are interfaced with the processor by using techniques such as the channel the backplane and networks here we notice that the networks are capable of sustaining high bandwidth transfer and their file server operating systems which support remote file access therefore we can say that the network attached storages have very high dependability but they are more vulnerable to the reliability hence we can say that in order to improve the availability and performance of network attached storage systems the disk arrays are essential here in the disk arrays the data is stripped across a set of disk which makes the collection appears to the software as a single large disk this means that the 
complete data file is striped into different sections. Here it is the software which interconnects all these informations and it appears to the software as if the whole of the information is stored onto a single disk. The throughput of a disk array is improved by many small disk drives because these small disk drives have got higher bandwidth. However, the drawback of an array with more than one devices is that its dependability on the devices increases. Hence, the reliability as a result of this that decreases because generally the reliability is equal to the reciprocal of the number of devices. The dependability of an array is improved by adding redundant disk to the array to tolerate faults. This means that in order to make the whole system more dependable and in order to take care of the faults which may occur on the disk, sometimes we prefer to include some redundant disk. Such a disk array is known as the redundant array of inexpensive disk or the RAID. There exist several different approaches to include redundant disk in the disk array. These approaches as we talked last time are usually classified by some numerical values where this numerical value identifies the level of the RAID. For example, we say that a RAID that is an array of disk is of level 0 if no redundant disk is added to this. However, the RAID 1 or the disk mirror array is one where each disk is fully duplicated onto its shadow. This means that we have got an array of disk and there is a shadow array of disk which is included. Whereas the RAID 3 is uh, known as a bit interleaved parity disk. Here in this case we use a parity disk for each group of data that is the parity is computed across the recovery group to protect the failure against any fault in the stripe data. Whereas the RAID 4 is the block interleaved and RAID 5 is the block interleaved with distributed parity. Both these uh, RAID 4 and RAID 5 devices, they use the same ratio of disk to parity disk as in the case of RAID 3, but they access data in different manners. In RAID 4, the parity disk is associated to each data block identical to as it is associated to each data group in RAID 3. Here you must note the difference between the data block and the data group. So it supports mixture of both the small as well as large reads or writes. Whereas we notice that in RAID 5 the parity disk is associated to each data block. That is, the data blocks are distributed among different disks in each row. That is, the stripe data units are not located on the same disk. So, this type of uh, arrangement allows simultaneous read of and write of more than one blocks onto the array. So, with this much review of Whatever we have been talking about the I.O. storages and their uh, 
performance, we will start with a new module regarding the networks and clusters. You know that up till now, our focus of studies have been the architecture of single components of a single computer and we have been discussing the performance of either the components or the computing system. Now today and in the following few lectures, we will talk about how to connect computers together to form network of computers. The formation of a generic interconnection of a network is shown over here in this picture where you can see that it is having the following standard components. These components are there is a computer node which is usually written as the node. A node consists of a processor and memory. It is also sometimes called the host or the end system. The other components of the network are the hardware software interfaces, the links to the interconnection network and the interconnection networks themselves. The interconnection networks are sometimes known as simple networks or communication subnets. Furthermore, the coordinated use of interconnected computers in a machine room is known as the cluster, which means that instead of having the computers at a long distance and connecting them through internet, if these machines are placed within a room, for example, the server room, then we call this type of interconnection as the cluster. The connection of two or more interconnection networks is called internetworking. The typical examples of internetworking is an internet which we normally use. However, the internetworking basically relies on the communication standards which are used to convert information from one kind of network to another kind of network. For example, in one system, if we have one type of machine and if at the other system there is another type of machine, then we must have a conversion of information from one type to another type. Furthermore, depending on the number of nodes and the distance between the nodes, the interconnections of more than one nodes are assigned different names. For example, a uh, name local area network or in general the LAN is used where the hundreds of computers distributed within a building in a small distance that is say up to a few kilometers is known as the LAN. Whereas the interconnection of thousands of computers distributed throughout the world and the maximum distance may be thousands of kilometer is usually known as the wide area network or WAN. The typical examples of WAN are the automatic teller machine in a bank or the registration of uh, air ticketing is another example. The third type of networks are known as the system area networks are SANS. Here the interconnection network is of hundreds of nodes 
within the machine room. It is not at a very long distance. That is here, the distance of the links is less than 100 meters. The sands are sometimes also known as the clusters. However, the Moore's law have contracted the definition of network to an extent that it defines the interconnection of components within a single computer. So I mean to say that the Moore's law in fact defines the network within a computer itself also. It means it is defining the interconnection of different components within a computer as the network. Now we will talk about the communication model of a network. Here we are considering the communication model to discuss the performance and complexities of the network. The communication model depicted here shows that the two machines are connected via two unidirectional wires and there is a FIFO that is first in first out queue at the end to hold the data. Here each machine wants to receive a word or message from the other. You can see here that in order to establish the communication, the machine A to get data from B sends a request to B. The B responds by sending a reply along with the data. Furthermore, in order to send a request and reply, a message is made which contains extra information beyond the data that is beyond the payload. The message format is shown here where you can see that for the request when it is sent a header is used. This one bit header here it specifies the message as a request when header is equal to 0 and it specifies a reply if the value of the header is equal to 1. Furthermore, the request carries the address of the data word and it reply carries the data word itself. Now, with this much view of the communication model, let us see what is the role of software in network interconnection. For the simple network considered here, the software is invoked to translate the request and reply messages. Here the network software cooperate with the operating system to distinguish between the processes on the other networks. Moreover, the software protect the processes running on the network and it ensures reliable delivery of the messages. That is to ensure that the message is neither distorted nor it is lost during the communication. Here it is worth mentioning that the reliability of the message is modified in the format by adding an error detection code as shown over here. Here you can see that instead of using only one header, a header as well as a footer is included. The footer or the trailer, it contains the checksum or the cyclic redundancy code checking code for 
error detection whereas instead of using only one bit header in this case we use two bit header you can see it from here that the two bit header now specifies whether the information contained in this message is the request or it is an acknowledgement to the request whether it is a reply or it is the reply acknowledgement furthermore in order to ensure the reliable delivery of the message the sender activates a timer each times a message is sent the sender copies the data onto an operating system buffer to resend the message if acknowledgement does not arrive by the time the timer expires and it presumed to be lost this means that in fact the software initiates a timer whenever it sends a data and then it waits for the acknowledgement if the acknowledgement is received within the due time which is initially set by the timer then it accepts that the data has been delivered whereas if no acknowledgement is received then it is assumed that the data has been lost in the network therefore the sender end resends the data the receiving end message is copied into the operating system buffer only if the required data has been received here the checksum is checked if the checksum are crc passed then the acknowledgement is sent otherwise the message is deleted from the buffer or it is deleted from the queue which means that it is assumed to be the message with some error in it so after this much discussion about what is the communication protocol what is the communication model let us talk about the network interconnection protocols while talking about the interconnection protocols we have to take into consideration number of uh, issues for some reliable communication for example there may be an issue when two machines from two different manufacturers have to communicate here in this case one of the machine may be using a different byte order as compared to the other machine for example one may be using the big adian and the other may be using the little adian format of the bytes so in this particular case it is the responsibility of the software to reverse the order accordingly depending upon for which machine it is going to work and from which machine it is receiving the data furthermore the duplicate delivery is another problem so the duplicate delivery of the message should be guarded against the late delivery of the original message for example if the original message has been stuck in the network and due to the time out feature it has been considered as the lost information but after some time if the message is received then it may be a duplicate message which is received because the original message has already been resent to the destination position the order of the sequence of the message is another issue so in the reliable communication the sequence of the message 
should not alter. So this means that we must devise the communication protocols such that a sequence number should be included into the message. Furthermore, it must also work when the receiver's queue is full because there must be some feedback mechanism to incorporate this facility and it must take care of this thing. Now, with these much basic issues for the protection, reliability of the network, let us understand the performance model of a network. The performance of a network can be modeled at any level through the interconnection performance parameters. The performance parameters of a network are the bandwidth. Bandwidth basically identifies the maximum rate at which the network can propagate the information. Whereas the other parameters are the time of flight, which is the time of the first bit of the message from time it departs to the time it arrives at the receiver. The other parameter is the transmission time, which is the time of the message to pass through the network, not including the time of flight. Here note that in the transmission time, it is only the measure of the time the message or the information is in the network. So, in other words, we can say that it is the time between the first and the last bit of the message arrives at the receiver. The other parameter is the transport latency, which is the sum of the time of flight and the transmission time. Whereas the two most important overheads are the sender overhead and the receiver's overhead. The sender's overhead is the time for the processor to inject the message into the network and this time includes both the hardware and software components. That is how much time the hardware is taking and how much time the software is taking in order to inject the message into the network. Similarly, the receiver overhead is the time for the receiver processor to pull the message from the interconnection networks and this time includes both the hardware as well as the software components. So, based on the network performance parameters, we can say that the total latency of the message is in fact equal to the sum of the sender overhead, the time to flight, the receiver overhead and the ratio of the message size to the bandwidth. So, by using this performance model, you can measure the latency of a network and from this we can find out what is the overall performance of a particular network. For this, I would like that you should go through some examples given in your book. These are solved examples. I cannot discuss these examples here because they are very simple, but they involve some lengthy calculations. Therefore, you are required to go through these examples yourself. Now, we will be talking about the interconnection network media. Here, you can note that just as the memory hierarchy is used in order to 
enhance the overall performance of the memory and to make it cost effective, there is a hierarchy of media to interconnect computer. The interconnect media in fact varies in cost, performance and reliability based on the maximum distance between the nodes. The metric for the performance measurement of the memory hierarchy and the network hierarchy are different in some respects. Here the most important is the distance between the nodes. So based on these different parameters, the three most popular types of media which are used are the twisted pair which is also known as a wire or a copper wire, a coaxial cable and fiber optics. Let us talk about these properties of these media one by one. So first of all let us consider the twisted pair of copper wire. Twisted pair of copper wire consists of two insulated copper wires each about one millimeter thick and they are twisted together. There is a twist on the two wires and this twist is given just to reduce the electrical interference because if the two lines are straight the interference between two lines due to the distributed capacitance of the line and some inductive effect of the line the interference is maximum. This interference can be reduced by giving a twist to these two lines which are otherwise running in parallel. The original twisted pair telephone line gave the data transfer rate of a few megabits per second and they are referred to as the level 1 or category 1 unshielded twisted pair cables. Unshielded twisted pair is abbreviated as UTP and it is usually specified as the CAT1 UTP. However, the level 3 or CAT3 UTP is good for 10 megabits per second Ethernet. As we increase the level, the performance of the cable becomes much better as the CAT5 is quite suitable for 100 megabits per second and it can go up to 1000 megabits per second when the distance is limited to only 100 meters. So let us now talk about the coaxial cable where a coaxial cable is a stiff single core copper wire which is surrounded by insulating material. This insulating material is further covered by a cylindrical sheath woven onto braided mesh. So it is basically a copper wires mesh which is wounded onto the shield of the coaxial cylinder. This you can see from this uh, figure also over here. A uh, 50 ohm base band coaxial cable can deliver up to 10 megabits per second over a distance of 1 kilometer. So the performance is much better as compared to the performance of a twisted pair cable. However, a coaxial cable can deliver higher rate over a few kilometers and it offers high bandwidth and good noise immunity. The third type of media is known as the fiber optics. Here we would like to say that unlike the twisted pair 
or coaxial cable fibers are used for one way communication or it is known as a simplex media. So, two fibers are used for two way or say the full duplex connection. The fiber optics contains a glass fiber core surrounded by cladding to confine light which is covered by protecting buffer. Here a light source which is an LED or a laser is used and a light detector or a photodiode is employed at the other end. The laser or the LED is used as a transmitter and a photodiode is used as a receiver. As we know that the light bends or it reflects which means that when a light wave travels it bends whenever it meets an interface and then it can spread slowly as it travels down the cable. So, this means that it reflects and then it travels down the cable. However, if the diameter of the cable is equal to or less than one wavelength, then the light wave is transferred into a straight line. Here at this stage, in fact, the angle of refraction is more than the critical angle and the total reflection takes place. The fiber optics are classified as of two types that is the single mode cable and multi mode fiber. The single mode fiber uses more expensive lasers with single wavelength whereas it also transmits gigabits per second for hundreds of kilometers. However, the multimode fiber is the older version. It is inexpensive light source is employed with wavelength larger than that of light. Here it offers wider dispersion where some wave frequencies have different propagation velocities. With this much introduction about the interconnect media, let us talk about the interconnect network structures. So far we have been talking about connecting two computers over private lines. However, interconnecting hundreds of computers is much more complex, challenging and interesting also at the same time. Different types of interconnections are used for this purpose. We have already talked about the bus based interconnect. The typical example of the bus based interconnect is a local area network or ethernet which is the simplest way to interconnect more than two computers sharing a single media. This architecture is shown over here where you can see that there is a single bus running with to which the processors and memories are connected and all these processors are sharing the same common bus. Here the processor and the memory units they are connected to each other through a single bus. So, this type of architecture is simple and cost effective for small scale multiprocessing. However, the bus bandwidth in this particular case it limits the number of processors which can be connected 
to a bus. Moreover, the bus based interconnect is more challenging as it requires coordination and arbitration as and when more than one computers want to access the same bus simultaneously. This we have already talked about when we discussed the multiprocessing. However, if the network is small and it spreads over a few hundred meters, then centralized arbitration can be used. The centralized arbitration, however, does not work when the network nodes spread over kilometers apart. So, in this particular situation, we have to go for the distributed arbitration. However, the arbitration works only on the principle of look before you leap. This means that we have to see if there is some message available on the bus and only when the bus is available it is handed over or it is provided to a new processor. But for a very long distance which is over a few kilometers looking first does not guarantee that it will always be exercised because in a particular situation if two nodes find that the bus is idle and they transmit simultaneously then this particular situation will definitely be leading to the collision of two messages onto the line. So, in order to avoid the collision, we must have to use different techniques. The normally used techniques are known as the collision detection and token passing. However, alternative to using the arbitration for sharing the media is instead of using the bus, we make use of the switches. The switch is in fact a device which has got dedicated line which it provides in turn to all the destination. That means a switch has got more than one connections available and to each connection a dedicated line is placed and it is the switch which hands over a particular line to a particular message. The switching therefore allows point to point communication and this communication is much faster as compared to the communication onto a shared media such as a bus. Furthermore, the switches are also known as the data switching exchanges or sometimes it is also known as the multi-stage interconnect networks or interface message processor that is the switch behaves or works like a processor and it provides an intelligent interface for the messages. Now having this much introduction about the switches, let us see how we can form different types of networks. This formation of different connections for different types of networks is known as the network topology. At present there exist large number of uh, topologies for the local area networks, wide area networks and the SANS. However, the most popular switch based topologies are classified as the centralized switch topologies and distributed 
switch topologies. Today, we will be talking about a few basic centralized switch topologies and distributed switch topologies. The centralized switch topologies we will be talking about are the crossbar and multi-stage, whereas the distributed are the 2D mesh or hypercubes. So let us first of all understand what is a crossbar switch. Then we will be talking about the crossbar switch topology. A crossbar switch is a non-blocking switch that facilitates unidirectional interconnection of all the inputs, that is any processor to any output to the other processors. The interconnection of a 2 by 2 crossbar switch is depicted here. Here you can see that the two nodes, that is the node A and node B, they can pass information equally to any of the two outputs. That is, A can pass information to either C or to D. Similarly, B can pass information to either C or to D. So this means that in a crossbar switch, there is no connection block and any connection between the processors and the memory units can be established. The organization of a crossbar topology for eight nodes, that is eight processors, is shown here in this figure. Here you can note that the crossbar switch uses n scale switches where n is the number of processors which are to be connected. Furthermore, you can see that here the links are unidirectional, that is the data comes in only at one. In this figure, it is only to the left side link and it goes out at the other and in this figure, it is the right side link. The routing in crossbar switch topology, it very much depends upon the style of addressing. There are two styles of addressing which are usually used for establishing a route between the sender and the receiver in a network. These two styles are known as the source-based routing and the destination-based routing. The source-based routing is one where the message contains the path to the destination. That is, the message includes the sequence of the outbound arcs, that is the outer links, to reach to the destination. So this shows that once an outgoing link is picked, the portion of the routing sequence is dropped from the packet. That is the packet which was originally containing the message as well as the route. Once it has been picked up, it is dropped. Whereas in the destination-based routing, the message simply contains the destination address. That is, it does not contain the route. And it is a program which is running on the switch which decides from a routing table built inside a switch that which port it has to take for a given address. That means that the location from the present position to the next position to establish a route is contained in a table. 
So, this way we can say that the destination based crossbar switch topology is one where the route is determined with the help of a program and at present there exist lot of programs and lot of uh, protocols to establish routes from source to the destination. Now here today with this much discussion about the crossbar switch topology we will uh, close our discussion and we will continue our discussion regarding the other types of topologies for centralized as well as the distributed networks next time also. So till then Allah Hafiz.